A couple of months ago, I stumbled across some pretty cool animations. The basis of these animations come from just 8 circles, but how they merge together in an organic way is what pops out here. I was curious how exactly this works, and my journey into this turned out to be way more interesting than I expected. Turns out these circular objects that naturally merge together are called metaballs, and there's a lot of deep mathematical and computational ideas that you interact with when you try to create metaballs. If you're anything like me, when you see these animations, you immediately wonder how you even begin to approach solving a problem like this one. I mean really, think about it. Imagine you were given the task of figuring out how to generate metaballs. How do you even frame the problem? What does it mean to have circles that organically merge together? How does a computer render something like this on the screen? These are all super hard problems. In today's video, you and I are going to go on a journey of how folks in computer graphics approach this very problem. The core algorithm that plays an essential role in generating these animations is called marching squares, and it's actually a technique that's used a lot in graphics applications as well as medical imaging. But as useful as marching squares is, I think what you might enjoy the most about this journey is how elegant the approach to solving such a problem can be. There's real beauty in taking a vague problem and transforming it into a form that is specific and approachable. The real goal of this video is to give you that sense of joy in discovering the shifts in perspective that make hard problems like this one solvable. So let's start by breaking down the case of two metaballs. From a bird's eye view, what we need to do is find a way to generate every frame of this animation. And if we slow down the animation, we can get a sense of how this evolves over time. Take a second to study it and see if you gain any insight. A lot of times when I ask you to do that, there's supposed to be some sort of reveal afterwards where I show you just the right way to look at it and boom, there's the clue. But this time, I'm right here with you. I have absolutely no clue what we can do here. No shame in admitting it. So let's maybe ask a more basic question. Are there any frames of this animation that seem easier to render than others? Any frames with two circles immediately pop out as easy cases. But as the circles come closer together, they start deforming and that's the part that's unclear. But amidst the chaos, there are a few frames where if we isolate them, our image looks a lot simpler. For example, here we actually have a shape that looks pretty much like an ellipse, right? And here, when the original circles are right on top of each other, we end up with just one larger circle. So even though we have no idea how to put these frames together, there are a few isolated frames that aren't that difficult to render. Sometimes when faced with a really hard problem, it helps to focus on what can be achieved. Let's start our journey with a quick discussion on circles and ellipses. They form the basis of the ideas around metaballs. Mathematically, defining a circle just requires two parameters, a center and a radius. For an ellipse, given a center and the length of the following two segments, we can define it with this equation. Not surprisingly, these functions are pretty similar in format. Both of these functions are examples of implicit functions. We have some function in terms of x and y, and the output of that function is some constant value. This is in contrast to other functions where we can have one variable explicitly defined as a function of the other. A lot of times, the implicit function definition is just easier to work with, as is the case with circles and ellipses. So going back to metaballs, for these particular frames, we know that if we can get the appropriate parameters of our circles or ellipses, we have the full definition of the shape that we need to render. So then, a natural question that arises is maybe the other frames have some mysterious implicit function that we can define. Even though we don't have proof of this, intuitively, it does seem that there should be some sort of implicit function similar to circles and ellipses for these shapes. And maybe these metaball implicit functions have properties that can allow for us to render them. But again, a lot of uncertainty here. So far, our approach has relied a lot on wishful thinking, so maybe it's time to shift our perspective. 
A lot of you are most likely familiar with the problem solving technique where the key idea is to ask a simpler version of the problem. There's another counterintuitive technique where sometimes it makes sense to actually ask a harder version of a problem. Right now, we're trying to figure out how to render frames of an animation where some frames are implicit functions that nicely define a circle or ellipse, and others could be implicit functions that render these merged variations of the shapes. The hope is that some of the ideas from how we render circles and ellipses may help us figure out how to render the other unclear frames. But this is just a specific case of a larger question. Can we figure out a way to render any implicit function of the form f of x, y is equal to some constant? This question looks like it might be much harder, but it's actually exactly the question we need to make some real progress on this problem. Let's play a game. Suppose I have some mysterious function that takes a point in 2D space and gives a scalar value. You are allowed to sample any point in the space and I can give you the value of the function at that point. Your job is to figure out all the points in the space that equal a specific value. In our example, let's say we want to find all points that equal 1. How do we approach this problem? The most basic idea is to simply sample points randomly. And if we're within some threshold of our value, we can then say we've identified a target point. But the problem here is that even with a fairly large threshold, it's highly unlikely that we end up close to a target point. So this is not a real solution to the problem. So you think for a bit and maybe you decide to simplify things a little. There are essentially two cases. Every point you sample is either greater than or less than the target value, and we can color code the cases. Points less than 1 will be blue, and points greater than 1 will be green. Now let's sample and see what happens. About 1000 points in, you don't see much. But as we get to about 10,000, maybe now you see it. Once we sample 20,000 points, the separation between the two cases starts to nicely define the outline we want. I'll add some target points now just to make sure we're on the same page. By the way, I'll refer to these target points on the outline here as a contour of our implicit function. What we're really trying to do here is find a contour at the value 1. And I'll also admit an ulterior motive here. I've always wanted to find a way to incorporate Batman into one of my videos, and this is one where I figured it out. Some of you may be familiar with the Batman function which I got from a random math stack exchange post, but fun fact, it's an example of an implicit function. A pretty ugly implicit function if we're being honest, but it yields a nice result. And what's really nice for our purposes is that the contour at the value 1 is defined by a change between points that are above 1 and points that are below 1. That sounds obvious when you see it laid out, but this is a really important idea that we can use to our advantage. Let's say I have two points from our implicit function. There are a couple cases to consider. It's possible both of the evaluated points are greater than 1. Here we have learned absolutely nothing about the contour we're trying to outline. We just know that these points are inside the contour, but how far inside is unknown. Another case is if both points are less than 1, which is equally useless. We are outside the contour but have no real information on where the contour could lie relative to these points. The third case is the interesting one. Suppose our function at point A evaluates to less than 1 and the function at point B evaluates to greater than 1. What does this tell us? Well, it must be the case now that the contour where all the points are equal to 1 is somewhere between these two points. And in fact, we could theoretically find at least one target point. We can continuously bisect the points any number of steps, with more steps leading to higher precision. It's essentially a binary search over real numbers, and this is the essence of the simplest root finding algorithms. One quick note, right now we're assuming that points greater than our target value are inside the contour, while points less than our target value are outside the contour.
We'll keep this assumption for the rest of the video, but just so you know, this is just a convention, and in some literature you will see this convention flipped. It doesn't actually matter since what we care about is the points that are equal to the target value. Alright, so we're making some progress. We have a way to find a point on the contour of our function over 2D space. Remember, our goal is to find an estimation of the entire contour. What we really need is some organized method to sample points. In any sort of graphics application, the first simple thing to try is to sample points in a grid-like manner. Let's say we create a grid of the following resolution and sample corners of each cell of the grid. Let's zoom in on a particular cell and think about what happens. There are a couple key cases. If all sample points on the cell are less than 1, we know this particular cell is outside the contour. When all sample points are greater than 1, the cell must be inside the contour. In both of these scenarios, there's not much we can do to figure out an approximation of where the contour is. But if there's at least one point that's greater than 1 and at least one point less than 1, we gain some information. Suppose the top left sample point is inside the contour and all other points are outside. What does this imply? Well, what we do know for sure is that the contour must pass through this cell. And in fact, we can perform the exact exercise we did earlier on these two points. One of these points is inside the contour and the other is outside. So with root finding, we can find the point on the contour. We can repeat the process on these two points as well, and the key idea here is if we connect these two points, that's an approximation for how the contour passes through the cell. Let's see another example of this idea in action. In this particular cell, we have the points on the left edge inside the contour and the points on the right edge outside. We perform root finding on the edges with a point inside and outside the contour to find exactly where the contour passes through the edge. And then we can approximate the contour as a line passing through these two points. The overall idea is that as these grids become smaller and smaller, the lines used to approximate the contour within the cell become more accurate. So we saw two cases for how a contour could pass through a cell. Let's take a look at the rest of the cases. There's a total of 16 cases since a point on the square is either inside or outside a contour. A good exercise here is to check your understanding and see if you can draw an approximation of the contour through the cell for each of these cases. We've already seen how it works for these four examples. Don't worry about exactly where the points are on the edge, that will depend on the implicit function. Remember, depending on the values of the implicit function at the corners of the cell, the endpoints of the contour could be anywhere on the relevant edge. To simplify things in your drawings, assume the contour just passes through the midpoint of any relevant edge. Now go ahead and see if you can work out the remaining cases. What you may have noticed is that even though there are 12 remaining cases, there's a lot of symmetry. Let's do some organization. These two cases are essentially the same since the outline of the contour does not pass through the cell. Then we have squares where only one corner is inside the grid. The next group is where every square has points on one edge inside the contour and the points on the other edge outside the contour. There's also two cases where the points inside the contour are on opposite corners. And lastly, we have the cases where only one point is outside the contour. In practice, the simplest method to implement this logic is with a lookup table containing this data. I do want to make a quick note about some subtle edge cases that you might have to think about depending on the application. In these two cases, we're assuming that all points inside the space here are also inside the contour, but that's not necessarily true. There's nothing that prevents our function from having a point outside the contour in the center of the grid. Most of the time, this won't be an issue, but it's something you have to be aware of and handle if necessary. 
A reasonably simple workaround that makes the approximation better is you can sample the center point as well to differentiate between these scenarios. So taking a step back to find a contour of an implicit function, here's what we've done so far. We take our two dimensional space and split it into a grid of squares. Given any square on that grid with sampled points from our implicit function, it's guaranteed to have a configuration of one of the cases we just went through. And then depending on the case, we'll find the points on the edges of the square where the contour equals our targeted value through root finding. We then connect those points appropriately. Now root finding is the primary method we've discussed to find the points on the contour with arbitrary precision, but in practice there's actually a more efficient method that's still fairly accurate. Let's do a quick thought experiment. Say I have a cell with the following sampled values from our implicit function. If the top left corner of the cell has the value 1.5 and the top right corner has the value 0, instead of doing a root find between these points to find the exact xy coordinate that gives the value 1, we can just approximate it and assume the contour crosses the edge a third of the way between the two points. We can repeat the same process on the bottom edge, where we expect the contour to cross the edge at roughly 3 quarters of the way between the two points. When we have an edge on our square with a point inside the contour and a point outside the contour, we can take advantage of a couple of key ideas to estimate the point in between. First of all, we're always going to know either the x value or the y value immediately. Remember, our contour point between these two sampled points is always on either a vertical or horizontal line, so there's only one unknown coordinate. And then the important assumption we'll make is the values of the function are going to change linearly from one point to another, which then allows us to determine the other coordinate with a little bit of algebra. The exact math of this defines a common graphics technique called linear interpolation, and this calculation is significantly faster than root finding. In most applications, this approximation is good enough that it's the preferred method. So let's put what we've discovered together into an algorithm, which is formally called marching squares. To restate the problem more formally, we have some implicit function and we want to get an approximate contour of the function where all the points on the contour equal some specific value. You might see these types of contours of the same value be referred to as isocontours. Marching squares is an algorithm designed to extract isocontours from implicit functions. But as complicated as that sounds, what we do is simple in principle. We define a resolution for a grid, and we basically march a square through the grid. Most of the squares will have either all the points outside the contour or inside the contour, in which case we just move on to the next square. But the important squares will be one of the other cases where the contour actually passes through the square. When we encounter one of these cases, we can find the points of intersection on the edges through linear interpolation and get a local approximation of how the contour passes through the cell. When our resolution is low, our contour is not going to look quite accurate, but as the resolution increases, the accuracy of the final contour improves. That right there is the core idea behind marching squares. Pretty elegant algorithm overall. Now clearly, the higher the resolution is of the grid we use to perform marching squares, the longer it'll take to generate a contour. So there's always a trade-off between accuracy and speed when it comes to this algorithm. But there's one more property of marching squares that makes it quite appealing for graphics applications. There's a term in computer science that I always found kind of funny. We call an algorithm embarrassingly parallel when it's easily able to be transformed into independent parallel tasks. What a term, right? Marching squares is an example of such an algorithm, and here's how it works. An easy way to understand the parallel version of marching squares is imagine for some grid resolution, I gave you a separate computer for each cell. The idea here is that you can process each cell independently from all other cells. In practice, you'll need a method to provide each computer with an easy way to calculate the scalar function value at each corner of its respective cell. 
That can be achieved by having a read-only map of points to scalar function values shared between all computers. Then once a computer processes the individual case for each cell, it can write geometry information to a shared memory location across all computers. Once all computers complete the write operation, we can use the information to render the entire contour. Almost all applications that require some level of performance with marching squares use the parallel version of the algorithm to their advantage. Let's now take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what we've accomplished thus far. Remember, we started this whole journey with the question of how we might render metaballs. We had a belief that metaballs are just a specific type of implicit function. So then we went down a path of attempting to solve a harder problem of rendering contours of any implicit function. That's what led us to the marching squares algorithm. Now we've solved the harder problem, so the remaining question is, how do we apply marching squares to generating metaballs? If we have an implicit function of metaballs, it's actually pretty straightforward. But what is the implicit function of a metaball? Now at this point, I could just spoil the answer, but there's actually one really incredible connection that I want to share that gives the motivation behind why the implicit function of metaballs is defined as it is. It's pretty cool, I promise. So far, we've really only thought about implicit functions with respect to a single contour value. But what if we considered several contour values simultaneously? When we try that, the contours of our implicit function put together look kind of like an energy field. And here's something that's really cool. By modeling each individual shape as an energy field, it's kind of interesting to ask, what might happen when I put two energy fields together? What does that look like? Well, a natural way to model the merging of these fields is constructive interference. And how we get that constructive interference is by summing together the individual implicit functions. That's where the curvature comes from. Pretty mind-blowing, right? Oh, and we're not done yet. The inspiration behind these ideas is something some of you may already realize. Those of you who have taken a physics class might recognize that what we see here is quite similar to how equipotential lines from two charges in an electric field act. If you have two positive charges and draw their electric field lines as well as their electric potential lines, this is actually a diagram you've probably seen before. The math behind metaball implicit functions ends up being quite similar. The electric potential at a particular point in this space is a sum of each individual electric potential contribution from a charge. And the actual electric potential value is inversely proportional to the distance from each charged particle. Can you guess the implicit function that we use to model a single metaball? It's essentially the same relationship. For a single metaball, we use the implicit function 1 over r, where r is the distance from the center of the metaball. And then if we want to model two metaballs, the final implicit function is the sum of the individual implicit functions from each metaball. I can't imagine what exactly you're thinking at this point, but when I first saw this, it just absolutely blew me away. What a nice connection between the realm of computer graphics, mathematics, and physics. Having this implicit function makes it quite easy to modify features of our metaballs. We can increase the size of a single metaball by scaling our implicit function, and we can also easily change the location of a metaball. If we have any number of metaballs that we'd like to model, we can just sum up the individual contribution from each implicit function. With these tools, making this type of animation is actually not terribly difficult. We define an implicit function for the number of metaballs we'd like to animate, and then we give each metaball a velocity and update its position over time. Every new position leads to a new implicit function, and every frame is just a rendering of that implicit function with the specified contour value. Marching squares then takes care of the rest. Before we close on these metaballs, I do want to give a quick note that even though the true implicit function for a metaball is defined as the inverse distance function, in practice, no one really uses that function since there are a few annoying properties that make it a little bit cumbersome. 
Folks in graphics actually prefer to use a polynomial approximation of this function that basically gives the same result. The reasons why are a little complicated and not something I want to get into, but I'll leave some further reading in the description for those that are interested. The same principles can also be applied to three-dimensional functions. To render a three-dimensional implicit function, we can use marching cubes. If you understand marching squares, marching cubes is a natural extension to 3D spaces. We split our space now into a 3D grid, and we march a cube through our space. The key difference is we now use sampled points at the corners of the cube to identify approximations of triangles that represent the surface locally. When you apply this to the entire space, you get a group of triangles that form a mesh that you can then use to represent your 3D object. Marching cubes is a really powerful algorithm, and if you want to see some really cool applications of it, I highly recommend this video by Sebastian Lag. It's really incredible and definitely worth your time. You now have a pretty good idea of some of the math and the algorithms that are behind animations such as metaballs. This is definitely a non-standard introduction to marching squares, implicit functions, and metaballs, but in a way, I think it's a nice method to learn the concepts. As a quick personal story, when I was in college, I briefly learned about marching squares and marching cubes in one of the graphics courses I took. It's a classic story. I learned about the topic in a lecture, there were some examples to demonstrate the concept, we had some homework on the topic, and eventually there was an exam. And then, like most people, I basically forgot everything about it. Going back through my notes from the course, I realized I never really understood how beautiful and elegant these ideas were when I first encountered them. All this to say, it was really quite amazing to me when I randomly encountered the topic of metaballs my interaction with this concept was completely different. I mean, it was really night and day. I was so interested in figuring out exactly how this worked, all the details, and I even implemented it as part of this video. And I think for me, framing it in a way where my goal was to actually build something using it, and then learning the details as I went through the journey was a lot more meaningful than listening to it from a standard lecture. There's a pretty big lesson to take away from that. A key part of learning new ideas and concepts, especially in the world of computer science, is to actually try play around with concepts that you interact with whenever you get the chance. There's so many extensions to ideas in computer science, and if anything, I hope you come away from this video with the feeling that the time you take to explore these ideas on your own can really be quite meaningful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.